Uh, I want to thank the ODC India organizers for inviting me to speak today and thank you all for attending this talk and for anyone who's watching the recording in the future. Uh, today I'm happy to be speaking on what I've learned about leading data science teams. The three D's of data science leadership are my best uh, working hypothesis of what it takes to be successful as a data science leader. I don't pretend to fully live up to these principles and I've learned about them many through trial and error and making mistakes. Uh, but they're the compass that um, I used to guide how we improve as a data science leader, and I'll be curious to hear your thoughts and questions after the presentation. So first, I want to give you an overview of my background so you understand a little bit about where I'm coming from. I also want to share with you how I understand the job of a manager or leader more broadly defined. Um, and then I'll really get to the core of my presentation, uh, the three Ds of, of data science leadership. So um, to tell you a little bit about me, um, I um, am trained um, as a behavioral scientist. Um, I've had a chance to work in the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team during the Obama administration in this capacity. Um, but most of my professional life, um, I've actually spent it as a data scientist, um, as an individual contributor at uh, the Walt Disney Company and at Capital One, um, and then um, also as a data science leader at both the Democratic National Committee, um, the Democratic Party of the US, and uh, at Ethan, uh, a fintech startup um, based out of, uh, out of California. So this diverse set of experiences has given me a chance to learn a little bit about data science and its leadership from a small fintech company to one of the largest media companies in the world and across different domains from banking to politics uh, to entertainment um, and to financial technology. So drawing these experiences, this is how I've come to understand um, the job that uh, a manager or a leader does. Uh, I think the guiding principle of my philosophy as a manager is that first and foremost, a manager reports to their team, uh, not the other way around. Uh, a manager uh, is good at their job only to the extent that the team that they're leading is, is good at theirs. Um, and more specifically, a manager has three responsibilities that are important to keep in mind. Um, the first uh, is that uh, they give the team um, strategic direction and tactical advice um, in the form of um, a roadmap for what the team is gonna accomplish and in the form of one-on-ones in individual conversations with members of their team. Um, they scavenge for um, and they deliver timely and important information to the team that helps them do their job. Uh, and then finally, um, they uh, secure resources to keep the team um, happy and productive, whether this is um, hiring additional team members, whether this is uh, finding budget for educational opportunities or for tools, um, I think these are the primary responsibilities of, of a manager broadly defined. And I, I certainly think that they apply in the case of, of a data science leader. Uh, so uh, moving on, uh, sort of with this definition of management as a framework, uh, this again is my best uh, working hypothesis of what it takes um, to be a successful data science leader, the, what I call the three Ds of, of data science leadership. Um, and the idea here is that uh, a data science leader um, wears uh, three hats. Uh, first, they wear the hat of a diplomat. So they have to uh, get the lay of the land um, and figure out uh, sort of what, the, uh, what is happening in the organization and, and what their team can do in that, in that space. Um, second is they have to act as a diagnostician, figuring out how the team can deliver value to the organization, given where the team is and given where the organization um, is as well. Um, and also how the organization can provide value to the data science team. Uh, and then finally, um, a leader has to also be a developer. So they have to figure out, given what they've learned and what the problems they've identified are, um, what they can actually uh, deliver uh, both for the team um, and for the organization uh, as a whole. So jumping into the first D, um, diplomat. Um, uh, there's three things to call out here. Um, the first is that as a diplomat, you as a data science leader need to speak the language of your cross-functional partners. Um, likely data science works in conjunction with a lot of other organizations in the company. Um, and, need to, and you need to understand a few things about them. You need to understand their values, what matters to them, their objectives, what they're trying to accomplish, and their needs. So wh where is it that they're struggling? Where, where is it that they need help? Uh, because it is from these three things that you can then design a strategic roadmap for a data science team that is informed by where the organization and where the company is. Uh, the second is you need to be able to speak the language of your team. Uh, this means you want to understand uh, their aspirations. Uh, so what is it that they want to work on um, and, and how is it that they individually want to, want to grow? Um, you need to understand their needs. So where is it that they are currently struggling and working and sort of help unlock that next level for each individual of the team uh, individually, but also for the team collectively? And uh, finally, you also want to think about and understand the strengths and challenges of your team, uh, which is what are the things that they are best suited to, to, to do and where are areas of opportunity for the team as a whole. 
And these team attributes, importantly, should then inform and shape the strategic roadmap that you produce for your team. You don't want to have a roadmap that doesn't take into account who your team is, where your, uh, who your team is and, and where they're starting from. Uh, and then finally, you then need to help uh, data, your data science team and the organization speak uh, and communicate about each other. Um, so you want to help others in the organization understand the value that your team can deliver and how it is that they can help the team to do so, how to set them up for success. And then you need to help your team understand the role and the value that data science can uh, provide to the, to the organization um, now and, and in the future. So the second hat that you wear as a data science leader, I think, is that of a diagnostician. Um, and here I start with the premise that data science is a really good way to solve some problems, but it's actually a terrible way to solve most problems. And you need to figure out which among the problems that an organization is facing, uh, data science can, is, is sort of well suited to work for in, in your particular company. Um, and it's also, uh, data science is something that's also very easy to get wrong. So you need to also figure out um, where it could, could potentially be going wrong and how to, how to fix it. So the questions that you're asking yourself are, can any of the organization's objectives be furthered by data science um, in any way? Um, and if so, how? Um, you want to understand what is currently preventing uh, your team from delivering more value to the organization. Um, and then you also want to understand what the bounds are of data science in the organization and whether these are uh, technical, so maybe you just haven't been able to work with the engineering team to set up some sort of pipeline, um, or whether they are cultural, whether the organization doesn't fully understand or recognize the value that data science could be providing in, in one of its domains. And then the, the final hat um, that a data science uh, leader has to wear um, is that of a, of a developer. So here you have to develop a few different things. Um, first, uh, you have to develop yourself. Uh, leading a data science team um, is very difficult. You probably haven't been trained as a data science manager. I'm, I, I haven't for sure. Um, and you can probably do better. So um, I think it's important for uh, data science leaders um, to read, think, talk, and write more and sort of think more about what data science leadership is and how they themselves can, can grow in this particular domain. Um, if you have a, a man if your manager um, was a data scientist in a, in a past life, or maybe currently is some sort of data science leader themselves, then this is, this is a great person to, to learn from. Um, but oftentimes, you may find yourself in a smaller company where you don't have access to this kind of resource. And so in that case, it's really useful to find mentors and, 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 and any sort of external resource you can find on, on data science leadership. The second thing you need to develop is uh, your team. Um, data science is a very hard uh, craft to master well. Um, and it's constantly changing over time. Uh, and this is why it's important to have a data science leader to often uh, guide a team and teach them some of what they know in terms of how to think about how to apply and how to do uh, good data science at an organization. Um, at the same time, it's important to, once you've sort of recognized the extents of what you can teach, um, get out of the way and let the team uh, do what they do, including learning and picking up new skills. Um, as I mentioned, data science is such a fast-growing field, and as I'm sure that you all know, um, so often your team will end up learning and developing skills that you may not be familiar with uh, tactically, but you can still give them some sort of strategic guidance on how to apply and think about using these tools. Um, and then also, you know, leadership, as I mentioned, is, is, is a very hard thing to master, um, but there are likely people in your team uh, who one day want to become data science managers. And I think it's important to figure out who these folks are. Um, how to help them grow that uh, talent as best as you can, given what, whatever resources are available to you, and set them up to one day, um, in, in a sense, take your job either at your same team or, or maybe at a, at a different team down the road. Uh, as a data science leader, you also want to develop the org, um, by which I mean that, um, as I've said, data science is a complex and, and a dynamic technical field, um, and it's very easy for organizations to get data science uh, wrong and to not fully understand what value can provide to them, and not necessarily to set them up for success by not giving them the right infrastructure and the, and the right tools uh, to, to get their job done. Um, and this is one of those cases in which you could argue, well, maybe it's the organization's responsibility to try to understand uh, the, the data science team and data science as a field and how that can help. But I, I operate from the principle that when you have two groups and one is more technical than the other, I think the onus is on the technical group to be able to explain and communicate and talk about with the non-technical group um, as opposed to the other way around. And so here I think a data science leader can provide a very useful role in helping the organization understand what data science can do for them um, and what it currently isn't and why. 
Uh, and here again, you're, you're trying to identify at the technical and cultural boundaries of data science in the organization and trying to push them to the next level, whatever exactly that, that may be. And then finally, a, a data science leader is also developing software. So um, you should probably be spending some of your time writing code. Uh, you know, this doesn't have to be 50% of your time, it may be 10 to 20 to 30, it really depends on when, where you are and sort of the size of your team and the maturity of the team. Um, but I think to, to really understand some of the things that I mentioned are important to understand about your team, um, it's very difficult to do that if you're not actually uh, in the trenches with them um, some amount of time. You may not have the bandwidth to own a very large model, you may not have the bandwidth to be responsible for any kind of large scale uh, analysis effort, um, but I think it's still important to be able to understand um, a lot of the, the, the stack and the tools that you're using uh, from their perspective. So although the primary advantage that you may be able to bring to a company may not be to be an individual contributor, I think a really effective data science leader is able to do that some of their time. And I think that ultimately makes them more successful in the other areas in which they do bring more competitive advantage to the, to the company. So uh, just to wrap up, um, and I'm happy to leave the rest of the time for questions, um, and, 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 and sort of conversation and discussion, because I, as I said, a lot of this stuff I've, I've learned from trial and error, and I'm curious to hear if any other data science leaders in the audience, what, what you think about this and what your own thoughts are. Um, but broadly, I would say that a, a data science leader to be successful has to wear three hats. Uh, first, they have to be uh, a diplomat. Um, they have to uh, get the lay of the land in the organization. They have to be a diagnostician. They have to figure out how they can best help the organization, how they can best help their team to improve. Um, and finally, they have to be a developer. They have to be able to do um, something about what they found um, to grow themselves, their team, uh, and the organization. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, yeah, and just leave it up for, for questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Uh, I don't... Yeah, I think so. Uh, thanks uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I do have a two question. One question which is more related to, you know, uh, the management skill or like the manager skill, which used to be earlier. What is the main difference which comes when it comes to the data science? Second thing, see these things, uh, the second que uh, question is, Yes, these things looks very good on the on the slide, but when you try to implement into the real team and all, you, you face those sort of a challenge. Is that the challenge which you see more from the team perspective or more from the leader who is who is managing in, in, in that sense? So uh, the first question was about the difference between data science management and general management. And then the second question, can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, so the second question is, as I said, so these things looks very good on the slide. Everyone knows it, like you need to be a, a good coach, you need to you know, yeah. let them know the problem statement and all. But when you try to implement on the real ground, you, you face lots of challenges. It is not that much easier. Yep. So the challenge in your experience was more from the team perspective or more from the leader perspective that he was not able to handle. Got it. Uh, so all right. So let me let me take on the first question first. So in terms of the difference between data science management and broad general management, um, I think here the probably the biggest uh, difference um, comes in this. Um, let me just try to get the slides to cooperate. So. Let me go here. Um, so, I mean, I think I think these are the ones that, that tend to be very di different for data scientists as opposed to other organizations. Um, the diplomacy part is particularly challenging because a lot of people don't fully understand data science or what sort of value you can deliver. Um, so I think that's, that's one area that, that's particularly different about data science. Um, the diagnostician is also important because often for data science to be successful, you need to have in place an infrastructure uh, in terms of data engineering and data analysis and a really good and tight partnership with product and with engineering that may not be, uh, uh, may not exist necessarily when, once you arrive. So helping the organization understand why that's important I think is really, is really useful. Um, and then on the developer part of it, I mean, maybe there's some difference there with the data science leader having to be spending some of their, their time as an individual contributor. I don't know if that's the case for, for designers or, or for other organizations, but maybe that's another difference. Um, and then to, to, to go to your second question, um, here I think the, the challenges um, are that I face are from a team perspective and helping the team understand uh, their role uh, in the organization. 
um, and largely, I think, also from a leadership perspective, um, particularly in smaller companies, and helping them understand what it takes for a data science team to be successful. I, I think a data science team, especially for a very early company, can be very aspirational. So it can be very much, this is the kind of work that we'd love to be doing, um, without necessarily understanding what needs to be in place to get that work to be really effective. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. So this might be more to do with your Democratic Democratic Party Association. So what went wrong with the 2016 election in terms of the data science? I'm not talking of the politics. Well, yes, you'd, have, you'd have had your own models for predicting the vote shares or who will win in the US election 2016, right? You're saying if, the, if the people are building those models? No, no, I'm asking what, what part of the data science or the data went wrong in the 2016 election for you while you're I mean, if you're associated with that election. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm no, no longer associated with them. Um, I, I don't know what kinds of models they're working on right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, and I know that they have. You were there doing that time? No, no, no. I'm no longer working on that now. <laughs> OK. So um, one question that I had was yeah. uh, you talked about uh, how do you look for the bounds of you know, taking data science forward in an organization, right? whether they're technical or cultural. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a technical manager and I've laid the platform that, okay, data science is now possible, yeah. I've created RFPs, use cases, but the business are not there yet, right? You know, the culture of the organization, they're still bound to an Excel-based analysis, right? So how do you as a leader, right? You might have faced the same uh, challenges. How do you as a leader propose that those boundaries of data science from a cultural standpoint can be pushed so yeah. that they understand the value. Sure. And then, of course, embrace it themselves rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. we pushing it from a technical standpoint. Got it. I, that's, a, that's a good question um, and something I think very difficult to do. Um, one suggestion um, is to build really strong uh, relationships with individual leaders in the company um, who may have some of those views and then ultimately trying to understand what their objective is uh, from a business perspective. So um, ultimately, they, they don't really care about the methods as much, I would imagine, as much as ultimately de delivering some kind of value. So maybe it's on, the, on you as a technical leader to help them demonstrate what the advantages are of data science in delivering that kind of value. Um, I would imagine that people largely care about delivering impact. So to the extent that they can understand how you're going to do that, and ideally how you're going to do that better, um, then that's, that's probably a case where they should be more open to thinking about something different. And you could also pitch it as, let's, you know, we have this idea, why don't we start uh, with a small pilot and see how it works, and, and sort of try to be as transparent throughout as possible to help them understand why and how you can help. Um, and, then, and then hopefully from that, assuming that they're, you know, they have the best of intentions and, and they really care about um, hearing you out, then um, ideally they can sort of start breaking some of those boundaries. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Especially if you're um, heading a data science team and there's no one above you that does data, you are absolutely an entrepreneur for data science consulting company embedded inside in a lot larger organization, for sure. Hi, uh, so I have one question. So you often mentioned that it's very easy in data science to go wrong soon, right? So uh, is there a way to uh, strategically what we have defined data science problem, is there a way to avoid at the earliest so that we are actually going wrong and not to do not to go this way, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, so for one, it's important to be clear with your stakeholders and your partners about what you can reasonably deliver within what period of time, um, and what kind of resources and support you're going to need to be able to do that. So imagine that you want to use a predictive model to score a, a certain number of people over some period of time. Um, but you actually don't have buy-in from engineering to provide you the software development that's required to get a data infrastructure in place to do that kind of real-time scoring. Um, so that's, for example, is a case where you may be setting yourself up for failure. Um, so I think just, just being aware of and communicating to others uh, what it takes to, to, to do good data science um, is, is one way to try to avoid that. Uh, hello, I'll go next. So my question is, uh, the, the skills that we mentioned are all three different sets of skills. Like when you have a developer hat, you have a diagnostician yes. hat, and you have a diplomat hat. So generally one starts with a developer hat or uh, getting stats in the background. But then out of the other two skills, one of which needs a people skill, the other one is product thinking. 
Yeah. Which one? So there are a lot of unknowns that are thrown, and everything seems important. So what is the order one should go around, and what is the rationale behind that? Uh, sure. So I, you're saying what the, what the order is, and what you should learn these skills, and, and sort of which ones to, to prioritize. Um, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I would imagine that it's probably better rather than focusing on you know being 100% at one before dive, delving into the others. Um, is to try to be 20% at all of them, and then 30% at all of them, and then 40% at all of them, and sort of recognizing that you want to be that understanding how you're doing these three domains and try to grow in them in parallel. Um, I would imagine that there are different kinds of errors you'll make if you're really good at two of these and are missing a third one, depending on what the third one is. Um, but I mean, I think maybe the ones where data scientists, at least from conversations with other data science leaders and just my experience, uh, most struggle with is the, is the diplomat part. Diagnosis is something that we do as technical people and, and, and have been doing for a long time. Um, developing is maybe something that when we sort of think about it, we can figure out how to get better at. Um, but the diplomat part can be one of the hardest ones for people because it requires increasing, uh, sort of at higher levels, increasingly more sophisticated relationship building skills. Yeah, yeah hey, this is Gagan. Yeah, I don't have questions right now. Okay. So this is Gagan. And you did talk about one very important point, right? It's more about the manager reporting to the team than the yes. team reporting to the manager, right? But ideally, you expect some quality in your team as well, right? But that's an ideal scenario. But what happens is it's not idle every time, right? And you can expect you have a team member, right? I mean, you're a part of data science team. And we do talk about skills that are needed, right? Let's yeah. say maths and coding. But there are some basic skills as well, right, that are required. Yes. Let's say the logical thinking, which is the most important skill that I feel, right? Yeah. So let's say, you know, you, you have a team, right, where you're managing a team and you face a challenging scenario where a person cannot think logically. I mean, like mm -hmm. he or she has the intent to deliver and give mm -hmm. you the results, but he or she cannot think logically, you know, like there are some boundaries yeah. within which he or she can think about. Yeah. So in your experience, like how would you lead, guide that team member in order for him or her to improve and, you know, like uh, move ahead in the data science area. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I'd say I, I, that that's a good question. I don't think the framework of you reporting to your team necessarily uh, is incongruent with that. I think you reporting to them, you needing to work for them, I, involves identifying their areas of improvement and then working with them to both, you know, get them to, to, to see that um, and then to work with them on, on how to improve it. Um, for the particular example you described, I mean, I, I think that, that that's a really tricky one. I haven't seen it myself before, but I think a part of it could be a, a sort of joint process of discovery. So if you're pointing out to them what it is that you're seeing, and then try to understand from their perspective what they're seeing and sort of what they felt and what they thought at, at particular junctures, then you can kind of do a, uh, a little bit of an analysis of their decision making and an analysis of the kinds of assumptions that they made, of the kind of uh, uh, reasons why they chose one path over another. Um, and then ideally, hopefully over time, assuming that they're uh, sort of curious and sort of willing to learn about why they did the things that they did, then you can start getting them on a path where they're more, a little bit more thoughtful about um, what decisions they're making and, and why. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's true, right? right. There, there, there's an extent to which maybe some people are less want to certain kinds of uh, uh, thought processes. Um, but to the extent that a lot of it could just be that they're, maybe they're, they're a more junior contributor and maybe they, um, you know, they, they can be really effective at that, at that thought process, but only when they sort of take a step back and think more broadly about certain assumptions. And I think maybe that's one of the things that's useful for, for, as a, for a manager to do is to help them take a step back and sort of think through things that they may not actually be considering otherwise. Yeah. Isn't, isn't a problem of hiring or like proper assignment, the right assignment of a right problem to a right person, like who has the acumen to think in I, those I terms? I completely agree with you on that part, but let's say, you know, like you are actually on a project where you are working with a team, right? And you cannot say that you gave me wrong people, right? I mean, I agree with you, like that could have been corrected at the first place itself, right? But let's say you are in that scenario, right? Then how it could be tackled? Because I mean, like it's all about uh, him or her realizing that this is not a good place for him or her, right? But at the same time, also figuring out if he or she can continue in this domain, right? Yep. Uh, Srinivas here. Uh, thank you for the nice summary. Sure. Uh, so it is the extension of few people that asked the question about the cultural thing. 
So in our organization, right, I see a lot of potential to add value if you have the data mm -hmm. in a certain way, right? It's not stored in any, any particular place. For it to be stored, in individual teams have to do certain additional work. Okay, the challenge here is that, okay, I give you the data, you get the visibility. What am I going to get, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, can you please add some uh, inputs over there? on how to get the data in place yes. or what are the things that we need to do? Sure. Uh, so I, I imagine that that will depend somewhat on your organization and what kind of data you have and, and, and what it looks like. Um, uh, I guess I'm curious in understanding, is there a reason why, I mean, where are, you, are the data are currently being collected, but they're just sort of stored in different places, but there's no data lake that, that, has, that gives you access to, to all of them? Is that the scenario you're imagining? Got it. So getting them into one place will help me to see the production performance and the lab performance are in Sankarna. And you know, based on the load that we are testing in the lab, you know, I can predict that in production there will be performance issues. Yeah. So, but the data is not in one place for Oh, got it, got it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that sounds like a case in which you can maybe work with a data engineering team who can help you understand how to bring the two data sets together into the same uh, place, like a, like a data lake kind of, kind of situation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Krishna. Uh, I have a question. So uh, the three hats of a data science uh, leader or a manager, so, so suppose a leader, a uh, manager uh, dons a hat of a diplomat, and then he goes on uh, getting, uh, going entrepreneurial for his team, and then, you know, poof, six months or nine months is gone. And then when it comes to the developer landscape, Maybe the landscape itself has changed. Like it's yes. a high, yeah. uh, what do you say? It's a high uh, changing field. So That's everything right. everything changes on a daily or a monthly basis. Yeah. So how can uh, a manager who has gone out of the technical landscape? I mean, it's not that he doesn't know. Sure. He knows it, but the thing is, he has lost touch of it, and then everything has changed. How can he lead a team of developers who are actually far ahead of him? Sure. Uh, so I, I'd say here maybe a little bit of what is relevant is this slide. Um, so I think some of what you can do is, so you're particularly talking about data science is changing and you need to be able to still lead people who are doing work that maybe you're not familiar with in terms of the, ult the, the sort of final strategic details, uh, sorry, tactical details. Um, so I think, you know, actually contributing as an, as an, as an IC is, is a helpful way to do that by actually coding and um, you know, contributing to models and contributing to analyses. Um, that's one way of sort of continuing to be familiar with some of the tools of the craft. Um, another one is probably attending conferences, maybe doing some, some training um, on the subject. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I, I think it's also just important to recognize that you're not going to be able to know all the things that the people on your team are working on. And that's okay. It's scary, but it's okay. Um, and that ultimately what you need to be uh, primarily for your team is, is a thought partner on strategically how should they should think about the kinds of tools that they're using and the kinds of methods that they're using and how to help them ask the right questions. Um, there is one advantage to actually not being familiar with the tools, which is that um, you can actually um, set up certain questions um, from a sort of more, more naive perspective um, where you're asking, hey, you made this decision here to, to, do, to fit the model this way. Why did you do that? Or, hey, you're using this tool as opposed to this other tool. You know, wh wh what was the reason for that? Um, and ideally, in those questions, draw answers that help you understand whether strategically they're, they're, they're sort of thinking about their, their analysis and their, and their modeling from the right perspective. But I think even at that level, you can be extremely helpful to someone, even if you can't catch like syntax errors on like a particular way in which they're choosing to implement a particular kind of model. Yeah. Um, so the question I would like to ask is, um, what would be the number one advice that you would have loved to know um, 10 years ago, or maybe when you were starting out your career as a data scientist, yeah. that would have helped you now as a data science leader, uh, maybe within a small team in a large organization, or maybe as the founder of your own company? That's a great question I want to thought a lot about. Um, so things I wish I would have known 10 years ago when I started, um, I think one of them is thinking of yourself uh, as a consultant um, inside of an organization. Um, and you're ultimately there to deliver value to others. Um, I, I, I was trained as an academic, and I think academics sometimes have this idea that we want to pursue very interesting and challenging problems, um, and we care about 
the sort of uh, complexity and sort of uh, elegance of a lot of our work. Um, and at the, at the end of the day in an organization, I think that tends to not matter as much um, to the extent that that begins optimizing away from delivering value within some period of time. Um, and I wish at a lot of the, the, the jobs that I've had that I, I could have spent more time in the beginning just almost working as an anthropologist, just understanding the organization, its leaders, their objectives, their values, their needs, um, just really digging into the sort of interviews with them to understand you know, how do they work? Um, why do they do the work that the way they do? Um, and from that, ideally, you know, assuming that you can think critically, you can start understanding why you and your team can add value. Um, I think some things I waited much too long to do that or haven't done it as efficiently as I could have. Um, uh, one of the things I definitely learned, um, and even, for example, is the importance of having really strong relationships with um, other managers at your level across your organization. Um, those weekly, bi-weekly syncs are really helpful to give you a sense into what's going on around the organization. Um, and then as the landscape is changing, figure out how you should adapt your team's strategic roadmap to change as a result. Um, so, so maybe be that one, just to spend a lot more time talking to people, talking to as many people as possible, um, and always trying to think about the work that you're doing in terms of what value you're gonna deliver and how much is it gonna cost you to deliver that value. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions there. Hi. Hey. Okay. Uh, so I'll just give you a background. I'm kind of a manager. I do a lot of back-end work. Now we've started to get into data science. So the biggest problem I have right now is uh, I'm not well-versed. And if I look at all the tools, there are hundreds of tools coming up every day. ML, deep learning, I'm just in a toss. I mean, this is a state of a manager. Given the amount of data scientists we have, it's a, I mean, you can't even hire them. To be honest, there are very few. So I'm kind of going through a transition. So at this stage, what sort of uh, references, I mean, like, um, what do I learn? I mean, how do I begin with this whole thing? Because I tried a course in Udacity for deep learning. I mean, I'm technical myself, so I've done a few things like that. But it, it's very hard to get into this, because after this, I have to take care of hiring, I have to staff. I mean, I'm a small, we run a small company, a small business. So what would be the first steps? How do I go about with this? Like, what are the good entry points to addressing this sort of a situation? I'm actually looking for specific newsletters if you have any recommendation because this was a very generic answer. Yeah. Something I've been doing personally, but maybe some specific newsletters that you personally would recommend. Uh, uh, sure, um, ODSC ha actually has a newsletter. Um, yeah. That's the one I was thinking about. Um, and then on Twitter, I'm happy to follow up offline afterwards and just give you some accounts. Yeah, sure, because a lot of these things are very technical. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for something a little more broader and kind of use case oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, I'll sync up with you offline. Cool. Yeah, that's very good. Hey. Hi. Um, so my question is specifically about one aspect of this diplomacy hat. Um, one, one issue that we run into a lot as an organization is kind of trying to translate 
technical timelines to non-technical mm. folks. Um, so often with non-technical problems, uh, to a certain extent, you can kind of define the roadmap. You can identify the roadblocks that you might hit and estimate about how much time they might take. But a data science problem often kind of defines itself as you go. Yeah. Um, like even just things like data cleaning. Like people often, <laughs> they're like, so why haven't you gotten started? I'm like, well, I've been spending the last month trying to like fix the, the data set that you sent me and I'm finding new problems every day, I can't tell you exactly how long it's going to take. Yeah. Um, and so I think sometimes like team health, like working overworking data scientists can be at odds um, with keeping up the momentum and keeping non-technical um, folks happy in a company. And I didn't know if, if you've run into problems like that or if, if you have recommendations about how to better address that or scope problems. Yeah, def definitely run into those problems before. I think it's a common issue I found talking to other data science leaders as well. It, one recommendation um, on the kind of time estimation side um, is, and, and there's some literature I've read here around how to estimate the, the time completion of software development projects. Um, so that literature, I think, um, if you just Google uh, software engineering um, or software development time, time estimates, um, will give you some useful guidelines and heuristics to use about how better to try to sort of estimate the, the, the time of a lot of these things that can be really amorphous and can really change in many ways. Um, Another suggestion would be to um, just be very transparent with your stakeholders around what's required to get from where you are to the final product, and that, and, and just make them aware, right, that there's a research and development period um, that uh, that will likely take some period of time, um, but may end up taking you know more for whatever reason. So that when you come to them maybe you know later and say, hey, this particular piece is taking longer than expected, um, one is they know what that piece is. They knew that it was going to be a part of what had had to happen, um, and, 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 and you can at least sort of go back to the expectation that you said before that this was going to take, potentially going to take a little longer than, than it had to, and sort of be transparent about why and how, and, and ultimately why you think that this decision to invest more time now um, is ultimately going to pay more dividends, um, more dividends later. Um, another thing that here I think as a manager is particularly helpful to do um, is for these broader research and development tasks is to um, work with your data scientists to be really thoughtful and mindful about how they are prioritizing um, the questions that they're asking, even in the research and development time. So you can just go ahead and do research and development for, say, two weeks, um, but you can also be thoughtful about, you know, what are the sets of questions that we want to ask and in what order, given what kind of uh, return on value we think we're going to get. Um, so some questions we may be able to answer you know, within a day, and they may tell us 80, the 80, 20 of this problem, maybe focus on those first as opposed to starting by building a really complex model that may find out, we may find out what is actually wrong, you know, a, a week down the road. Thank you. Sir. You can have this. You can have this. So what I've seen in my organization is that uh, uh, several non-technical leaders go from not being aware of machine learning and data science at all to now having really high expectations because of the hype. So how, would, how do you manage the hype and unreal expectations uh, from you know data science? As in they just want to apply data science to everything and yeah, expect yeah. really good results. So how, how would, in your experience, have you managed that? Yeah, so that, I think that's, that's in some ways a good problem to have and that people are really excited about your team and what they can deliver. Um, and then I think for managing expectations um, when they want maybe too much or something too quick, um, one could be helping them understand how the bandwidth of your team maps onto delivering against different kinds of projects. So you know, given the fact that we have, say, three or four people now, reasonably, among these five different things that you want to do, we could do one or two this quarter. So that, I think, is a useful way to start helping them understand um, the amount of time and effort that it takes to, to, to get certain projects out the door. Um, and that might, A, first help them think through among these five things that I want you to do, really which are the ones that are most important. Um, or you know, maybe we want, actually want to keep on growing your team um, because we actually want these five things you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and then the second thing I think is, um, and I think where I've seen companies go wrong, um, is not thinking through a little bit, OK, if you want you know, a, a model that does x and y and z by this date, um, there's a whole series of things that need to be put in place um, in terms of data engineering and, and analytics and maybe reporting. 
um, in, in, in sort of building some of the underlying tables that, that are going to support that use case, um, and how to help the company understand that until you have those things, um, and until you have people who can help you build those things, or until you, you can maybe hire internally to, to sort of be able to, to, to get those things in place, um, you're going to really struggle delivering value and why. I mean, I think if you can sit down with folks and just be transparent about that, um, then I think that's maybe the, the best way to, to start. So you're saying uh, the question is whether I've seen uh, companies uh, want expect that a data science solution is going to completely change or transform the way that something is done. Oh, um, yeah. No, I, I haven't seen that in particular, but I yeah, I, I imagine it, it can be common. Um, I mean, I think, again, that's maybe a case in which you can help them understand, um, you know, one, you know, whether that's feasible at all, and two, if it is feasible, what the, what the cost to get there is, um, as you're pointing out, you know, maybe it takes a month to get to 80%, and maybe it takes another month to get to 90%, and then you can help them figure out whether, um, given their priorities and given other requirements that the team has to complete, um, whether it really makes sense to be spending a whole other month on just, you know, a 10% lift. 